This presentation is about ionic compounds and ion formation and how to predict charges and things like that. In order to figure out uh, how to predict the charges on ions, we have to first think about the periodic table. We learned in the last unit about first ionization energy, and that describes the amount of energy it takes to remove electrons from a substance. So elements down in the lower left-hand corner of the periodic table are elements that are easy to take electrons from, so they lose electrons readily. And for the most part, most metals lose electrons very easily. And that may have, you know, may be somewhat related to their ability to conduct electrons as well. So anywho, uh, metals tend to lose electrons. And uh, when you lose electrons, you end up with a species that has a positive charge. On the other hand, up in the upper right hand corner, uh, the elements like fluorine and chlorine and oxygen are elements that like to gain electrons uh, much more readily than they lose them. So they tend to form ions with negative charges. Uh, we completely ignore the noble gases because we'll soon learn that they have the ideal arrangement of electrons and as such they tend uh, not to lose or gain electrons and form ions. So in order to figure this out, uh, we're going to take a kind of close-up look at the periodic table. What we're going to focus on are the A groups. So the first two columns and the last six columns, and actually we'll pretty much ignore that last column, like I said, the noble gases tend not to lose or gain electrons. So they typically are always going to be stuck with a zero charge. So the whole uh, name of the game in forming ions is for an element to gain or lose electrons to look like a noble gas. And here are, you know, a collection of most of the noble gases. Uh, helium with two electrons, neon with 10, argon with 18, krypton with 36, and xenon with 54. And it says protons, and then I must have had a, a mistake there. The second P should be an E there. So let's take a look at uh, fluorine. It's the next door neighbor to neon. It currently, as an atom or as an element, has nine electrons and nine protons. But uh, if it were to take on a noble gas electron configuration, it's most likely going to look like neon. So it would gain an additional electron so that its electron configuration would look like that of neon. And if it has 10 electrons and nine protons, it has 10 negative charges, nine positive charges, and the net is a negative one charge. So elements in the fluorine family, group 7a, the halogens, are the ones that take on a minus one charge very readily. And uh, a fluorine with a negative one charge changes the name. It changes from fluorine to fluoride. Uh, the same with chlorine would become chloride. Bromine would become bromide. When we go to oxygen, it likes to look like neon as well, and in order to do so, it picks up two electrons. So it has 10 electrons, eight protons. So it also, it would end up with a negative two charge. And again, if we've changed from the element to the ion, the ion ends in ide, so ide. So oxygen forms minus two charged ions, and we call it oxide. Sulfur and selenium would do the same, and their names would be sulfide and selenide. Nitrogen uh, would need to gain three electrons in order to have the same electron configuration as neon and uh, would have a negative three charge and we'd call it nitride. Um, and phosphorus would do the, the same and we would call it phosphide. When we look at the other side of the table, as I mentioned, uh, elements uh, on the other side of the table tend to lose electrons easily and sodium is no exception to that. So sodium likes to lose electrons and it will lose electrons in order to achieve a noble gas electron configuration. And sodium is element number 11, neon is element number 10. So if sodium were to lose one electron, it would look just like neon. So here's kind of a summary of that. Uh, now sodium has 11 protons, 10 electrons when it looks like neon. So the net charge on that would be plus one. And there's no name change for the, the metal ions. 
no one decided to change the, the name uh, there. So it's still sodium, but we would just call it sodium ion. By the way, uh, elements with positive charges, we call them cations, and elements with negative charges, we call them anions. Magnesium is element number 12, so losing two electrons would allow it to achieve a noble gas electron configuration, so it would then have a plus two charge. If I go all the way over to aluminum, uh, aluminum has three more electrons than neon, and once it gets down to 10 electrons, it would have a positive three charge. So let's talk about putting elements together to form compounds. When ions combine, they combine in ratios that produce compounds that have no charge or neutral charge. So when I look at potassium, I can pair it up with chloride very easily. I can see a plus one and a minus one put together would give a compound with no charge. And we'll always observe a pattern of a metal combining with a nonmetal for binary compounds. So binary ionic compounds are always going to have a metal plus a nonmetal. So when we put these together, like I said, uh, the formula I can um, write a subscript describing the number of potassium ions combining with chloride ions. So K1, Cl1. Anytime the subscript is 1, we generally leave it out. So we would typically write KCl uh, only, and the name of that compound would be potassium chloride. So let's put uh, sodium and sulfur together. Now sulfur takes on a minus 2 charge, and sodium a plus 1 charge. Some people can just intuitively see the ratios that these ions need to combine in. Others, uh, it doesn't come as easily, but one way of thinking about it is to use what I call the crisscross method, where we uh, transfer the magnitude of the charge and use that as a subscript for the opposite ion. So uh, sodium's uh, charge is plus one, so I would carry the one over and make that a subscript next to the sulfur, and for sulfur, its charge is minus two, and I would transfer that over and make that a subscript on the sodium. So the formula could be Na2S1, or since the subscript one is generally left out, we would just write Na2S, and the name of that compound, sodium keeps its name, and the ion would be sulfide, so sodium sulfide. So let's put magnesium and nitride together, or nitrogen together, I guess it would be nitride. Again, doing the crisscross method, I get Mg3N2, and the name of the compound is magnesium nitride. The crisscross method sometimes gets people caught. You get in a pattern of doing this crisscross here, and if I do the crisscross with aluminum and phosphorus, a uh, plus 3 and a minus 3 respectively, uh, I might be tempted to write Al3P3 for the formula. Thing we do with ionic compounds, we write these in the simplest ratio, and the simplest ratio we call that an empirical formula. So the correct formula for aluminum phosphide would be Al1P1 or just ALP. So here's a chance for us to think about names, and I'll pause a little bit here for you to, to look at uh, the compounds that I have, and maybe you can kind of think these through in your mind. Um, so maybe I'll be quiet for uh, a couple beats here. So maybe you've had a chance to look these over. Um, naming ionic compounds is really easy. You just name the metal and take the nonmetal and attach an ide to the end of it. So the first one looks like it ought to be potassium phosphide. The next one, aluminum bromide. Uh, followed by sodium oxide and magnesium iodide. Providing formulas is a little bit more tricky. We kind of have to break it down uh, and maybe have a periodic table handy. So what I need to do is figure out which ions are involved in each of these, and I think this is going to animate one at a time here. So let's see. Oops, it didn't. Well, let's talk through it anyways. Uh, for calcium chloride, I know that the calcium is in my plus two column on the periodic table, the chlorine in the minus one. So doing the little crisscross gives me the formula CaCl2 for calcium chloride. 
Lithium phosphide, likewise. Uh, lithium is from the plus one column. Phosphorus is in the minus three column. So doing my crisscross gives me the formula Li3P. Aluminum sulfide, uh, again, let's do a crisscross there and I get the formula Al2S3. Magnesium oxide, I have to resist the urge to do the crisscross because I can see right away that the plus two and minus two uh, combined together will give me a neutral compound. So the formula would just be MgO.